All right, we welcome the internet to, uh, today. I uh, hope it's a blessing to you. We're going to talk about pleasures forevermore, and we're going to start in Psalm 16. I'll read the whole chapter. Guess what? 1 through 11. Psalm 16, 11. Where, where do you know that number? King James Bible. All right, now watch. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, that thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints. Now you got, you, did you read what you just said? Did you read that? Now let's read it again. Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth. I mean, a lot of things happened to the Lord, wasn't it? I mean, did he come into a world that hated him immediately? Because of the God of this world? Did the God of this world hate Jesus? Did he try to disrupt the birth of him? Did everything. He lives in this world, created by him, the word. And he comes to his own, but his own don't want him. And But there's somebody that will. He came unto his own, but his own received not, but to as many as would. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. And everything that Jesus did, God the Father allowed to happen because it was a righteous thing. God cannot just save people and when I say that, don't take it wrong. God can do anything He wants. But in righteousness, He can't just save people. There has to be something that balances it out, like the checks and balances. You understand? You, if you are on a weight scale system, uh, if, say, Harold goes in and he wants a beef weight, he don't want some character that has messed with the weights and bore them out and made them light. He wants them correct. He wants the right balances to balance the scales. I mean, uh, justice, why, did, why is the woman blind? That's right, it's impartiality. In other words, a person sells you something, he's to be impartial, he's to be correct, and he's to be just in it. And God is only just. He's the only just thing there is. And his righteousness comes by the faith of his son, not by you. You're not righteous. You never will be. His righteousness is by the faith of his son. And so his son, we see in the Bible, as in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 5, that Jesus feared. He had prayer. Everybody, hold this just a second. Go to Hebrews 5 and read this with me so that you understand is it, is it normal to fear? Yes, it is normal to fear. And it is not something that God is mad at you if you fear. And you all do fear. You fear the time you're in right now. Uh, <clears throat> if forced, wanted to go be with the Lord, he wouldn't have cared about it. He just laid down and died. No, he's a human. And he hurts. We have flesh that hurts. It pains. And so we go to the doctor. We try to get fixed. I, I mean, Paige didn't just lay down at home and die. She went and got fixed the best she could. I mean, we're humans. Is it wrong to have fear? Well, if it is, read this verse and tell me how. All right, verse 7. Who in the, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong cryings and tears unto him. Did you hear what the Lord did? What did he do in that verse? Did he have tears? And cryings. When you've been in something really bad, did you ever cry and 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 have tears with the Lord Himself? Not somebody else, but with Him. I mean, the question I asked a while ago, David, and was asking about: Is there an exact verse where it says that the devil can't read your mind? I said no. 
we have to look at the other verses when the Father said, pray in secret and your heavenly Father which can see in your secret. In secret. And he said, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperate and wicked, who can know it? And he said, I, the Lord, try your hearts. And then uh, we groan within ourselves. We can't know what we pray for. Uh, the Spirit maketh intercession for us. In Romans 8, 26. Uh, anything you do privately, if it gets answered by the Lord, is a blessing. Because you understand nobody knew it but you. People say, why don't you tell us about more about your problems so we can help you? Because I did it with the Father. Uh, I was telling them about that deal when I reached in my pocket. That was a blessing to me. Because my jacket had been hanging for about six to eight months in the closet. And when I had that tire blow out and it cost me $180 in Buford, Georgia, I pulled it out. And in the envelope, it's a cash envelope, not from my bank. There's $300 in there. It's been in there for six months. And it just, at that time, God said, I just reached in my pocket. There it is. Whoa, what's in this envelope? Hold it open. There's four fifties and five twenties. And the tire cost me $180. Well, that covered it. And you think, how did that come about? How did you do that, Lord? And the Lord wants to say, shut up. I'm taking care of you. I take care of squirrels, ticks, and chiggers. I'll take care of you, too. You're my child. Well, the Lord <clears throat> is in a situation where he's not doing it for himself. He's doing it for the saints. Isn't that what you were reading? Isn't that what the verse said? He did it for his, the saints. Okay. The saints are down here. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. There are saints that God has known before the foundation of the world. According to Ephesians chapter 1, uh, he has known us before the foundation of the world. There are saints down here that one day they need the gospel preached to them. Why? Is it the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes? How simple is it? Christ died for our sins. That means as he's crying and tears are coming... He knows that he's fixing to die a death that the saints ought to have died for. Are you with me? He died for what we ought to have died for. And he's crying to the Lord with supplication. His supplication. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's supplication. Ain't you supplicating with the Lord? Don't you have the right? Yes, you do. Philippians chapter 4. But you do it with thanksgiving. He's doing it with thanksgiving. He's also doing it knowing that the joy of what's going to come later on. The joy overcame the fear and the problems and the misery. Have you lost your joy? Are you always grumpy? Are you always in a bad mood? Are you always thinking about what the world does? Get over it. Look at the joy that the Lord has presented to you ahead when He'll either change your vile body and fashion it like unto His glorious body, or He'll let you go to sleep in the Lord, both being the same, caught up. And then the last verse of 1 Thessalonians, comfort one another with these words. Now watch this, Hebrews 4, who in the days of his flesh when he offered up prayers and supplication with strong cries and tears unto him, they was able to save him from what? How would he save the Lord from death? He raised him. But how did he Pray at that moment, save me from the death right now. Am I missing you folks? In the flesh, he's afraid. Say, oh, I don't believe that. Well, let's read on. And was heard in that he, what? Did the Lord fear? He's, he's the word. 
He's the faith. But what's the end? The flesh. What are you in? But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So you got two things working against each other. You're in the flesh physically. Galatians 2, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If Christ liveth in you, you can't die. Am I missing you, folks? If Christ lives in you, you can't die. Your flesh could go away, but that ain't death. Because death, because of his fear, has been taken care of. I don't, am I missing you, folks? Listen, folks. The pleasures forevermore. We're going to see this. Now watch. Heard that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Okay? Go back to Psalm 16. I don't know how much stock you put in this Bible, but you better put it all in it. You can forget your IRAs and your Social Security and your bank account and your savings account. You better put your stock right here. Because <coughs> all the rest of that's going away. All the rest is going away. Now, it's Psalm 16, verse 4. Their sorrows should be multiplied that hasten after another God. Now, obviously, the God of this world wants worship, doesn't he? Isn't that what he wanted in the three temptations of the Lord on the mountain? Number one, food. Number two, hate of safety. Number three, power. Those are the three things that he tried the Lord with. He tempted the Lord with him. Food. Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. Can you imagine what we look like if we fasted 40 days? We'd probably eat each other's arms and faces off. Fasted 40 days. Praying. Praying for 40 days. I don't know whether he's even praying for food. I think he's praying to the Father, telling him all about his experiences on earth in the flesh. I believe he was relating to the Lord God Almighty, which has never been able to feel what Jesus, his son, felt. Because God is a spirit. Jesus now is in the flesh. Jesus is the son of God. But he came and got in the flesh that God Almighty made, just like he made for Adam. And he lived in that flesh. And I bet he's talking to the Lord and he said, just that they just discuss, Lord, this is what it's like. This is what they're experiencing down here. This is their problems down here. The things I'm being tempted with are the things that they can't they can't handle. They can't handle it because they're humans. They have an infirmity. It's called sin. And I'm being tempted with what they can't handle. And I'm very uncomfortable. The trials and temptations are hard, Lord. It would be easier just to back off. It would be easier if they loved me. It would be easier if I had friends everywhere. It would be better if I didn't have to go against the Pharisees and the publicans. And the sinners and everybody else. But I love you, Lord. And you promised me. You'd raise me. Amen. Verse 5. An no, verse 4. Another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer nor take up their names under my lips. It'd be easier to give in, ain't it? You ever notice that in your life? It's easier to give in than fight. It's easier to lay down than to stand against. It's easier to run than fight. 
He didn't. He didn't run. He didn't give in. And he fought. He fought for you. He lived his life for you. He fought the world and the God of this world for you. And he won. He gave us the victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through the end of the chapter. Let's read on. The Lord is the portion. Shut up. The, uh, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance. And of my cup thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. You ever notice that night time's the worst when you're having trouble? Your weakest time is at night. Man has a fear of darkness. Uh, there's something there. Man that's evil and is wanting to do something, he likes darkness because he can hide in it. But the normal person, darkness is usually when something happens or that it's, it's just a, a fearful time. You have imaginations working in darkness. You think you see things and hear things and, and all the animals and the critters come out and you hear things and darkness. Well, did you notice the world went dark when Jesus died? I'm, I'm not going to leave you to get that. The Messiah, the Savior of the world, left. And darkness, the light left. Watch. I have... Uh, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Verse 7, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. And by the way, no matter what happens to the Lord, where will he always be seated? Okay. You believe that book's good enough for always? Is it good enough for always? Or do you say, well, it, I hope it don't have some contradictions in it or some lies in it. You might have retrained your thought. This is God's word. Read on. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I, will not, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou will not leave my soul in hell. Where do you know that quote? Well, that's, that's quoted in Acts 2. Peter quoted it. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Two things. His soul's in hell and will not be left where? The body lays in the tomb, rests in what? Hope. You know what the hope is? It won't see corruption. Four days is corruption. He's raised the third. Are you with me? Now watch. For thou not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou will show me the path of life. The path of life. He died on a cross. He died for our sins. He was buried. Now, I don't know if I can get this over to you. You'll never be buried. Come on, folks. If you're a believer, you will never be buried. They'll put your body away. That ain't you. Say, if you believe it, yes. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Was Jesus buried for you? 
Folks, it all happened or it didn't happen, any of it. Did he die for your sins? Was he buried? So that you never will be. And did he raise again the third day? And is it according to what? Then you will never be raised from the dead. How's that? Because you ain't ever in the dead. You ain't never in the dead if you're a believer. Your hope, even as others which have no hope, they're not raised from the dead. Death and hell are brought out and they're cast in a lake of fire. They have no body. Their naked soul burning in the lake of fire forever and ever with the devil and his angels. <clears throat> if you're so blessed that you have trusted the Lord, you will never have that. Read on. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at the right hand there are... Read it to me! How long? Pleasure forevermore. 16.11. Isn't that amazing? I guess God put that in there, you reckon? <coughs> now watch. Look in Hebrews 12. I've never heard anybody really say that about burial. But you can't be buried. If you can be buried, you're in trouble. And you will, your body will see corruption, and it'll see corruption, and you'll never have another one. Oh, that hurt, don't it? Especially those hundred year guaranteed vaults. Seal won't leak. Who cares? Somebody said, I ain't going to get burned. That'd be awful. Burned? Who cares? Well, how's God going to put my ashes back together? Well, what difference it make? <laughs> Folks, don't you understand how people have been manipulated by the system to make money no matter what they do? Yes. It's all money. The love of money is the root of all evil. All right? Hebrews 12. Look with me in verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And that's from reading whatsoever thing written, a time written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of Scripture might have hope. As you read back, you read about the witnesses of the Lord and whether they were willing to die, willing to suffer, willing to have anything taken from them just to give glory to God Almighty. Do you have that kind of guts? Or you get mad when somebody takes something away from your pencil. Now watch. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher for our faith. Who for, now listen to this. Who for the joy that was set before him. That's Prophecy. That's the psalm where you're reading. That's the acts that Peter quoted of Psalm 16. That was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your minds. It's already done. Everything he already did is did and done. And you don't have to worry about it. But he shows you that he was looking for something far beyond what he had. He endured for the saints. He suffered for the saints. Why? Because, number one, the joy that was set before him. He'd be at the right hand of the Father again. That means everything that happened to him, everything that was going to happen to him would still be taken care of and the joy would be there again. He left the Father. He came down. When the fullest of time was come, God sent forth the Son, made of a woman, made of the law. 
He lived in a body made of flesh from this earth, dirt, from the womb of a woman. He had the world hate him. His own hated him. Everybody mocked him. Everybody shamed him. Even Peter denied him three times. And on the cross, as he hanged there, they embarrassed him in front of his mother, took his clothes off, naked, embarrassing him. He's been beat so bad his blood's almost gone. He's thirsty because of lack of blood. They give him vinegar and gall. They put a crown of thorns on him and drove him into his skull. They have beaten his back so raw, his bones are sticking out. He's on an old rough tree, and they're laughing at him. They have pulled his beard out before that and spit in his face. And it for us. No greater love hath a man to give than to love that away. He's a hero, folks. Beyond any comparison. A hero of a man that would do that for people that don't like him. And then one day, he came to a little man that hated him. Named Saul of Tarsus. And he said, I'm going to, I'm saving you and what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to enable you. I'm going to let the words of the experiential thing that you do in your life, the afflictions that you suffer, I'm going to let you write it down. And I'm going to give it to Jerry Sanders in the 20th century. I'm going to wait 20 centuries for a saint that I know before the foundation of the world to understand my love him he loved me and gave himself for me can I look for the same joy yes whatever this world brings there's a joy beyond <clears throat> beyond that <clears throat> Look at Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Maybe I'll be all right. It's coming back, but the God of this world is not going to leave. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1. Now, I just got a few things I'll say, and I won't go long. I don't want your beans to burn. <clears throat> this is our right given to us of God. This is a beautiful right here in Philippians chapter 1. The first thing I wanted to bring forth is verse 28, Philippians 1, 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. So I guarantee you, you got adversaries. But don't be terrified by them. If you're not terrified by your adversaries, they don't get it. It's their job to terrify you. Don't you understand that things are going on in the world? Nobody knows what they're doing, even in the evilness, because the God's world's leading them. Why, Judas didn't even know it was him. Lord, is it I? He didn't know. The apostles are asking, Lord, is it I? Who is it? They don't know it's Judas. Judas don't know it's him. Then Satan enters in. But how did he enter into him? The love of money. 30 pieces of silver, he denied his eternal destiny with God. That God had let him be in part of that ministry. Denied it for 30 pieces of silver. There are people denying all around you because of the love of money. The evangelists are doing it. The governors, the preacher of uh, the the preachers, the governors, the magistrates, the judges. Why, even Alabama's got the best team country to buy. No. <laughs> oh, listen to me. People for the love of money will do anything. Jesus would, but Jesus would. But you're given a right. A right here. Now watch. 
He said, which is the evident token of perdition, but the use of salvation that is of God. You're saved. And they can't understand why you can't get terrified. You can fear, but not terrified. Now verse 30. No, 29. For it is given unto you, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to what? You've been given the right to believe. You like that? You like what follows it in the verse? <laughs> I always ask people, I said, you love that, don't you? What about the rest of that verse? What does it say? Why you suffer for his sake? Well, let's see, Romans 8. I listened to Blinky the other day it, for about two minutes. Thanks, baby. Uh, and he uh, he was talking about how once you get saved, everything's going to be all right. <clears throat> yeah, if you give to him, it will be. Romans 8, <clears throat> verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Why is it who? Could it be a God of this world? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, I fear lest by any means a serpent uh, beguiled Satan, uh, Satan beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of Christ. He's coming after you. Man, he comes after you with every human you can think of, every means he can think of. His devices are many. We talked about it last week, the devices of the devil. He's got all kinds of devices. He's coming after you. He wants to corrupt your mind if you're saved so that your witness stops. He wants you to fear, but he wants you more than fear. He wants you to be terrified. He wants you to get to a point that you're afraid to open your mouth. Because it ain't coming out of religion, the truth. It's coming out of you. Jesus himself told his apostles, you don't take a candle, put a bushel over it. You hide it. <clears throat> oh, you don't let it be hid. You make it manifest. It's your moderation, your yieldingness to the Lord. Let him work out of you. How do you do it? With fear and trembling. Paul talked about it. I mean, if anybody should have had the guts, it was Paul. I mean, he exhibited his guts, you might say. But he said, I come with you with fear and trembling. Why? Folks say somebody after him all the time. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, the thorn in the flesh was given. And he said, I besought the Lord three times that it might be relieved from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. <clears throat> Amen. I got a Cherokee the other night, and I was like I said, it was five o'clock. I was too late for the uh, five thirty or six. I was too late for zooming. And I got out of my car, and they got this auditorium over here across from the Drama Inn in Cherokee. If you've never been there, it's right on the river, one of the cheapest places I could find. And they got this Indian Nation auditorium built there, and we're having a hot rod show the next uh, on Friday night. They're having a uh, hot rod shows. This guy's in there preaching. Got a mic on him that's blowing that city away. He's screaming at people. It pleased God by the foolishness of screaming to save them that believe. Just screaming on it. And all of a sudden, then he brought up the dispensation of grace. He didn't finish it, but he said, There's all kinds of dispensations in the Bible. I never did hear the gospel. What good does it do to scream if you don't give the gospel? No. Romans 8, <clears throat> verse 35. Who shall separate us? Who? Not what. It's who. Somebody's coming. From the love of Christ shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. So is that in the capabilities of this who? Does this who have those capabilities? Of course he does. He has the capabilities of everyday tribulations for you. 
right? Does he have distress for you? Does he have persecution for you? Does he have famine, nakedness, peril, and sword for you? You betcha. That's like wars, rumors, and things, okay? As it's written, for thy sake, you're fine, everything will be cool. <laughs> no, the verse says, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all those, all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go back to verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Who did he deliver him to? Who did he deliver him to? What happened to Jesus? He died. He actually went into death. Let's just check it. All right, Hebrews. <clears throat> Hebrews 2. <clears throat> In Hebrews 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through what? He actually went through everything that death had to put. How are you thinking, folks? Everything that death has to produce, did he go through it? Okay. Obviously, then, if you're in Christ, you went through it with him. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself to the Father. Then his Father did what in Hebrews? What did the Father do? He delivered himself. He delivered himself to the Father, the will of God, and then the Father delivered him to what? He gave him to what? I mean, come on, folks. God the Father turned his back and let something happen to Jesus. What happened? He died. He gave him to the devil to do whatever he's going to do, and the devil had him killed. Correct? No, when Jesus gave himself, he gave himself to the Father. Wasn't that the will of the Father? Father, if it be thy will, here's the supplication. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. For God so loved the world that he gave him where? He gave him up as an offering. An offering to death. Now let's read this again. Through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus told him, he said, fear not him that can kill the body. He said, fear him that can kill the body and cast the soul into hell. The devil can't cast you into hell. He can kill you. But again, you can't get buried. Am I making any sense to this, folks? He can kill you, but he can't cast your body into the grave, you into the grave, because you ain't going there. You can't get buried. Your hope is Christ in you, the hope of what? Glory. 
We've been glorified. We have eternal life, the gift of God. We know that if earthly house of this tabernacle resolve, we have a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. You can't be buried. You can go be with the Lord. Fear not him that kill the body. Fear him that can kill the body and cast soul into hell. That's God. Fear him. For he is almighty. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. And you understand what he did. He defeated the devil. Turn to Colossians. In Colossians chapter uh, 1 and 1 Corinthians 15. Is everybody all right? 1 Corinthians 15. If you're afraid to get burnt, just get burnt. Just cheat that undertaker. Give him the pleasure of that money and that casket and that vault and everything else. Hey, just get burnt and have them throw you on somebody you didn't like. <laughs> or put it in their pipe tobacco and let them smoke you. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of saints and light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated. What's hath? Well, then guess what? In your redemption, which is through the blood, you're already translated in the kingdom of his dear son. You're just waiting to get rid of that mortality. And the mortality you're in is called an infirmity, and it's a constant battle because this mortality should be presenting the glory of God. Wasn't it given to have to believe on him? Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. But not only believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. Mortality in the flesh, alive. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself to the Father. The Father gave him over to death. Don't let me forget Ephesians 5, just a minute. Gave him over to death. Okay? Now, this is the verse that they mess with in the NIV and the NASB and all the other. Now, watch. Colossians 1, 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Next word. Even the forgiveness of sins. No confession of sins. Even the forgiveness of sins. Well, wait a minute. If I'm already forgiven of sins, then I'm ready. Colossians 2 said we're complete. All I do is just wait for that time. I'm ready. I'm ready spiritually. How about mentally? There's where your battle is. <clears throat> your body's fighting you. Your body's fighting your spiritual mentality of that groaning within ourselves to be released from this body. Because we like our body. We clean it, and we paint it, and we wear things over it, and we want to drive in a nice car, our body in it, and we want to do this and that. That's our body. All the time there's a new man inside going, well, I want out of this mess. And the body says, shut up. You, you say that God might just kill you today. He would say, I, I'm ready to go, Lord, take me. They're afraid to say that. You know why? Because he might do it. I don't want to say nothing. God might do it. Yes. Uh-huh. There's the battle. 
the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and they're contrary to the one which you couldn't do what you want to do. Now watch. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Turn to Ephesians 5 before I quit, uh, uh, forget, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 15. Ephesians 5. What kind of sacrifice could God make with animals that would cover you or clear it up? No, they can't. It just covers. Well, what kind of person in the world can he take? Can he take Paul and sacrifice him for you? No, he's a sinner. You can't take sin and clear up sin. Don't you understand? People are laying their sins on the altar. Sins won't clear up sin. Offering God your sins. Ain't that lovely. He don't want them stinking things. I mean, because I laid my sins on the altar. Bull, you're supposed to lay a sacrifice that's clean. Ephesians 5, 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, and what? Here I am, Father. Do what you will. I'll be their sacrifice. For the saints. I will be their sacrifice. Father said, Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he gave him to death. This sacrifice was what? An offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. The religious world around you is offering up their iniquity, their sins. For a sacrifice to God. And he said it's a stench in my nostrils. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10 through about 15. He said do away with this. It's iniquity. It's a stench in my nostrils. The solemn meetings. The offering up of, of rams and blood. And he goats and incense and abomination unto me. And on and on. What people are offering up to God is just pure sin. And he said it's a stench in my nostrils. It's iniquity. And he said, the mystery of iniquity is working. People think that's how they're going to God. They went to church. They did all kinds of things in the church. They were good to their neighbor. On and on and on. And they will not make it. Because they didn't take and receive the love of the truth. He gave himself to the Father and the Father gave him up to death. And <clears throat> through Jesus Christ, we that trust that will never be buried. We will go to the Father however he calls us because we're already forgiven of our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, I'll shut up. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received and where you stand, by which also you are saved. Saved from what? Death. If you keep remembering what I'm preaching to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Look at verse 55. 1 Corinthians 15, 5, 55. O death. Let's go back to the end of 54. Death is swallowed up in what? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. One last verse, Colossians 2. I have to go with this. 
God said to Mike, you're complete. Mike says, Lord, what do you mean I'm complete? I've done everything that's necessary for you to come to me. Do you want it? The rest is up to Mike. If Mike chooses it, then God seals him so that nothing can separate him. Now watch, Colossians 2.10. And you're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. When Christ left his body, Mike left his body in God's mind. Then it says, buried with him in baptism. When Jesus Christ went into death, Mike was put into death. He said, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith, the operation of God. Jesus believed that God would raise him from the dead. And if he's raised from the dead, Mike is raised, justified, glorified, and can never be buried. Amen. Amen. I appreciate you being here.